эрхэм мэрэгэлэгчдтэй шинэ жилийн мэндүргий мобиком сайн байцханаа хүн төзөгчтэй өнөөдөр манай де факто нэвтрүүлгийн зочноор английн ковентри их сургуулийн профессор доктор харди орж байна good evening good evening you have been giving a lecture at UB Impas in the Mongolian National University. That's right, yes. I've been here for three days and I've given three lectures. Three lectures yes. in where so else? They've, they've kept me very busy. Okay. Where, where else other than the so university? So I did a workshop with at GIZ. Okay. And uh, this morning I gave, a, I had a meeting with other universities at the Shangri-La and we okay. had another workshop. All right. So. And main topic of your visit and lecture is issue of trust. Yes. Why trust is so important? Well, it's one of the least rated areas of uh, human interaction. And yet, we know from our research that it's fundamental to the prosperity and the security of society. So as a social indicator, those countries with high levels of trust, where people relate to each other very strongly, um, we find more prosperity, more security, more safety, and generally a more harmonious society. Why is that? It is, what you said is a kind of result of study, right? Surveys. Mm. And uh, what is that driving force that the trust well, is so important for if, prosperity? If you take another type of survey that's often done, which is one based on economic indicators and uh -huh. um, prosperity and economic growth, uh -huh. Growth, you know, doesn't necessarily guarantee harmonious societies because it's not always distributed fairly. It's not always generated um, um, with integrity. Ask Mongolians now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a problem not just here, but in many countries that the, the systems that generate our wealth are not always looking after the best interests of social cohesion. So trust is a more fundamental relationship issue between people. So if, if I trust you and you trust me, the cost of our engagement is much lower. I don't have to bring on new regulation. I don't have to check you out. I don't have to uh, get references for everything you say or you recommend. Mm -hmm. And that extends also to um, our relationships with organizations. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned in your lecture two things, trust among people mm. and trust between people and institutions. Yeah, yeah. And why is it sometimes the trust in institutions is very important? Why? So I think part of the fabric, we find that in most societies, people trust those who they know very well and those they, that they have contact with. So it's not to be unexpected that people will have very close trust relationships with their family, with their immediate community. But some of the most important relationships are between individuals and the state, or individuals and their bankers, mm -hmm. or individuals and big organizations. Mm -hmm. And there we find trust is much more problematic. Mm -hmm. So if you take the experience here in Mongolia, in the last 20 years, what a transformation. Transformation from a period when there was very low trust in institutions, mm -hmm. very low trust in government, mm -hmm because you will recall government was quite distant. And we were afraid of them yes. at, at, at times, yeah. at often. Yeah. So what happened in that period, and this happened in many other parts of the world as well, mm -hmm. is that people had distrust in organizations and reinforced their trust in those who they knew. So this creates a challenge for, for the modern times. Mm -hmm. We have to try and increase the amount of trust that people have in institutions because we want them to participate, we mm -hmm. want them to engage, we want them to be full uh, active citizens because that's what will lead to a Mongolia which will be harmonious, which will be prosperous, uh, in which we'll spend less time worrying about our relationships and more about the future for our families. Uh, what would be the most interesting, or most, uh, I would say, influential driver in a society like post-communist society like Mongolia, where we can increase the trust of people and in our institutions. Hmm. 
you're right. In many former communist countries, that trust, this distrust was so huge mm. that it is eventually slowly disappearing, yeah. very slowly. Yeah, yeah. But what is that we can do to make it faster? So I think the, and it's, it's not, a, not a challenge that's simply restricted to post-Soviet societies, because mm. we have equal problems of trust in, in my country, in the United Kingdom, with some of our businesses and some of our banks, but we can return to that if you like. But the big driver for me is participation and engagement. Mm -hmm. So here we have democratic elections, mm -hmm. we have a large number of parties, we have an emergent democracy, we have voters who will vote for their political leaders, but until they trust the representative role of leaders, they won't continue to be engaged, continue to participate. So. What I think we need are, are two things. We need a commitment to participation by ordinary people mm -hmm. who want to take a stake in the future mm -hmm. and who expect their elected representatives to be just that, representatives. Uh, you said uh, participation goes on until you have a full trust? Or what is the process, how okay. it is interconnected? So I think that trust follows experience of ah. mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. So. I will trust you mm -hmm. when after a, a period of knowing you, mm -hmm. I know that I, I'm prepared to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and trust you to look after me. Yeah, like uh, uh, ordinary people to do yeah, so. Right. Yeah. Because if you met somebody many times, you more tend to trust. Yeah. Because you know what kind of behavior, maybe certain values you already understand. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, so this is about, it's about communication and it's about participation. It's about um, full engagement of people in the future of the country, I think. This is a part of democracy itself, full yes. engagement. Yes, because democracy without involvement or engagement of ordinary citizens, it is not democracy. No, and it's always a series of events from one election to the next. And the only time you get involved is when you have an election. That's what's happening in Mongolia. Is that true? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, let's go a little bit in details. You have been uh, very interesting uh, giving as a lecture on this. Uh, but, well, this trust we said now with the people, with the institutions. And you said building up the trust is the, a way to make more prosperity. Hmm. So your perspective is very interesting because we usually consider economic growth. We sure. see material growth, hmm. yet we're not much paying attention to the social capital, no. if you... If sure, you, yeah. I think that's very perceptive. My view is that economic growth is a necessary condition for prosperity, but it's not sufficient. Uh -huh. Alone it will not bring you prosperity for all your people. Uh -huh. It might be quite unequal. What would be the sufficient? So I think that the social um, solidarity of your people, mm -hmm. their ability to coexist in harmony, and this is about social trust, yes. is, a, is, a, is another condition which is also necessary for prosperity. Let me, let me give you an example. You have an issue, I think, in Mongolia that I've been told about, about foreign imports of food. Yes. Right, this is a simple example. Mm. So when you go to your shopkeeper to buy your food, do you trust that shopkeeper to sell you safe food? Or do you have to monitor and regulate and check and research? We have to. You do? Yes. So how much of your time and energy is spent in regulating and monitoring and researching your purchase instead of just making it? It makes shopping more expensive, more of your time. Yes. So you translate that into other parts of Mongolian society without trust, you have to have compensating, regulating, monitoring processes, which are very expensive, and divert you from prosperity and harmony. The same is happening with the quality of building, or new apartments, whatever, yes. it's, it's brand new, but you, ha you need to uh, be confident that these materials are good, good for That's your so. health. The paint they have used is mm. also good. And we are not sure. Nobody is giving a guarantee that this is the safe, secure sure and then you go and even there's a confusion of even spaces the the particular space you buy yes sometimes it's a wrong information yeah the wrong and shape there yes. was well they represented it in a wrong square meter mm. uh, amount mm. and later on a person 
exactly because of uh, uh, his uh, concern, he go to a professional company and ask them to their measures, and they did hmm. so certain differences. And you like you keep paying for something that you don't own. Hmm. It's very popular, for example, the service today. Hmm. So, so that's uh, what I think you I are think it, referring it's, to. It's right. And, you know, in most most societies, we have a combination of trust-based relationships supported by regulation and um, monitoring. The role of the, the government is very important. So, for example, the, the government in in my country protects my relationship with my banker. So I, there, there are rules and regulations, which means that I don't have to trust the bankers for everything because there are protections. Now, where protection is not strong or where your courts are not effective, where my recourse to you through a legal process is not, I need to have trust-based relationships. They're much more important. So where there is a no, not much trust between people and uh, and institutions, then the court has supposedly to play a better or more role. But when you don't have a trust in this court system itself, then you then have, you have even a problem. more problem, isn't it? So the, the court doesn't replace trust. I think what it does is it supports the development of trust. So in, in modern economies where the legal processes are strong, for many years the courts have been there. Yes. And that leads to a context where people are able to develop trust-based well, relationships. Well, in that sense, your country, being also the uh, leading economy and being a lot setting standard in the human society, made, I think, much better uh, uh, court system than any other countries, yeah, personally, so, to me. So we have a compensatory structure, which mm. helps. So let me I give you another example. Sometimes the small examples are very powerful. When I'm in Ubi City, uh -huh. I can get into a taxi and I can ask the taxi driver to take me somewhere. Yes. I have to trust him. Yes. I have no other means. I don't have Google Maps. Yes. I don't have any yes. knowledge. And because I'm a positive person, I trust him. Uh -huh. Now, if that taxi driver several times takes me by a very long route in yes. order to earn more money, yes. eventually I will not trust the taxi driver and yes. I will have to have other methods to secure that relationship. Now, in a, in a more... Um, experienced economy with longer periods of time. We know in London, for example, the taxis are heavily regulated. Yes. If, if they try to cheat me, I can take them to court very easily, yes. to the small claims court. Yes. I have a, a structure around me that, that I, makes that I more difficult. I noticed in a taxi, in a cab in London, that they would say immediately, no, this is the way, but this is now very heavy And they'll tell you. Yeah. And I can do it around that, that yeah. much longer, yeah. but may, we may do go faster, the taxi driver is saying. Yeah. And it sounds very friendly. Yeah. And, uh, so under, underpinning that are two things. One is that you, you're describing um, a social solidarity of mutual benefit. The taxi driver will develop a relationship with you, you will mm -hmm. lose taxis more, his business over time will develop, mm -hmm. um, and the status of taxis in London will be yeah. raised. Here, here you are saying that if your customer trusts in your company more, yeah. Yeah. so you make sure that your employees, your products truly serve the customer, sure. and the customer believe, then you have more business, yes, more it, profit. Yes, it's in your own interest. And yeah. that's the, the model of mutual that's trust. That's what we're saying. That, that's basically what market economy does itself. Because if you have no trust, you're gone. Sure. Sooner so, or later. In certain conditions. You're okay. absolutely right. But take the, the position where we have imperfect markets, where we have monopoly. Yes. Then you have what we call uneven power That's why not to have. Yeah. We should, not, we should try to have a perfect market. Perfect market, in my understanding, you correct me if it is not. Perfect market is a market where the information related to this, any part of the market, goes at the same time to every place. Exactly. Right? So that's that's very a very good definition, and it's an it's an ideal. We'll never reach it, but never we reach, should yes. we should avoid monopoly if we can, mm -hmm. because monopoly le can lead to ex exploitative relationships, ones which. Um, in which there is one side takes advantage of another. So my, my passion for trust is that the, if we give more attention to uh, the relationships between people, 
based on integrity, based on benevolence, then we will have the better prospects for, for okay. social uh, progress. You said about two th very important things, integrity and benevolence. Yeah. Let's talk about integrity. How, what is that? So my reference to integrity was about how we might build trust through making strong expectations of our leadership. I mm -hmm. think leaders are critical. Mm -hmm. And they're not just political leaders, they're media leaders like you, mm -hmm. or university leaders and so forth. I think one of the qualities that's really important is that we have in our leaders an ability to be benevolent. And by that, I mean the literature tells us that leaders should not only be confident in their actions, but they should listen to their followers. Mm -hmm. So a good leader will be confident and able, but also will listen to make sure that... Even it's not very pleasant, but you have to listen, yes. you have to listen, yes, and you have yes. to accommodate, you know, and, and integrity is about fairness and justice. Uh -huh. And you will not trust a leader yes. who isn't fair. Yes. You might not agree with your leader, you might not agree with your boss. But you, you don't, the problem is you don't immediately realize that the leader is not walking his talk. Exactly, yeah. And it takes a certain time. Mm. And whole societies, in a way, lose certain value mm. because of time. Mm. And in a democracy, while you are re-electing or waiting for the next election, it's a bunch of time you lose, no? Mm. So I think, you know, when your political leaders, you give them a vote, mm. you should expect them to act with benevolence. You should expect them to continue to listen to you mm -hmm. as a constituent. You should expect them to work with integrity, to be fair and just. And the, the final element I was talking about was predictability. Shouldn't we expect our leaders to react in the same way so that it's predictable and expected? Yeah, um, this is so important for everything. You make yeah. decisions and you know that your leader will be unpredictable. Mm. Then you cannot see things for a long run, at least. Yeah. Um, but that, I mean, You are here three days, sorry. Uh, unfortunately, very short <laughs> time. It's such but a... you have noticed probably that people have distrust in the society, new emerging democracy in our institutions because, as, as it was said at the seminar, that the source of our institutions, and as any democracy, are dependent on the quality of political parties who mm -hmm. sooner or later takes the power in their hand, mm -hmm. right? So how to make sure that the political parties are integral? They mm -hmm. have really the trust source mm -hmm. which will replicate to other our political institutions hmm. or in our government institutions, how to do so, how to make sure that that trust is in the political party. So I'm not an expert on Mongolia. I've, I'm really very... Well, in case of UK. Very happy to come here and, and see, and I've met and spoken to many people. But I think the same question can be asked in the UK. And it's, it's really about consistency. Mm -hmm. It's about... Um, continual relationships, and it's about communication, those three things. Communication. So, trust, and, uh, trust in your leadership comes from openness and from transparency. When you are able to challenge, when you are able to hold people to account, and I, my expertise is in dialogue and, and, and dialogue between people of difference, whether it's in a conflict situation or in a multicultural city. If we have the ability to talk to each other, to listen to each other, mm -hmm. we don't need to agree with each other and we don't need to like each other. But if we have dialogue, we will become stronger in mm -hmm. our understanding of each mm -hmm. other. And that will lead to a stronger basis for trust, I think. Uh, in democracy, the, you remember the Reagan once said, Dobirai, no probirai, the Russian words. Mm. It says, uh, trust, but check. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, that's what I ob observed in your country when the people were raising a voice about the political party financing. Mm. You have a wonderful electorate committee. Here in Mongolia, we have election committee. Mm. 
which is consisting of, again, politicians, mm -hmm. not ordinary people. Your committee is consisting, in majority, from non-partisans, and the rest is from other political mm -hmm. parties. Mm -hmm. But that <clears throat> electorate committee not only does make sure that the election goes in a fair, just way, but also they check, report, and monitor that the political party donations, mm. financings are mm. fair, open. Mm. And I thought that is something make big confidence to people. Mm. That there are electoral committee mm. who is making sure that these people are not you know, corrupt. So the, ele the Electoral Commission is, is, is sophisticated. I don't think it's perfect. I think we have much to develop. The financing of political parties is a problem everywhere because what you're worried about is whether it, with, with modern-day marketing, with commercial mm. uh, pr promotion, whether people with money have an advantage over people without, people mm. with access to resources. Mm -hmm. We'll watch now for the next 12 months the electoral process in the United States. Mm -hmm. It will become very interesting. Yes. But there there's quite significant heavy control over sources of funding yes. and access to the media. Without that, you know, the rich would, would prevail and those who would buy television space would have much greater advantage. And that would undermine some of the basic principles of liberal democracy, I think. So what to do? Mm. So what, what to, to do? do? Well, I think, you'd, I think there is a case. Reagan's statement about trust and check was, was quite clever. I think, you know, many people underestimated how s clever and effective President Reagan was. I was one of those. I thought, how can a Hollywood cinema star be a president? Initially, how skeptical we were. Yeah, we were. And I think, looking back, he was quite a considerable president. Yep. And, but what he was describing was, let's use the word trust, but let's not rely on the action of trust. Let's check. He wasn't talking about trust. Yeah, this you, is the part of democracy still. Yes, yes. Still, in spite of everything, even mm. the trust is high, mm. we should not miss this institutional capacity of monitoring by yeah. people. That helps give confidence, doesn't it? That's it. Yep. But, but you'll find, if you look at the Edelman barometer of trust, Countries like mine, the United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, very low trust. It's, it's quite interesting. Very, the highest trust in the developed world is in the Scandinavian countries, who for many years have had strong partnerships between people and their government. Mm -hmm. Socially democratic government, quite invasive government, high levels of tax, high levels of involvement. And that's led over the years to much stronger rapport between people and government and, and higher levels of trust. And yet in your country, it's not that much bad. No, it's been strong. Germany as well. <clears throat> we've seen in recent years a, a, a fundamental decline in trust in government. This was partly due to some real events in the last decade or so. Yes. You know, um, the British government took Britain into war in Iraq and... It, and in Libya, and this has been seen to be not to the advantage of Iraq or Libya, and certainly not to Britain. People feel let down. But uh, however, by the way, recently you made also your uh, Congress made this, this UK uh, lawmakers made decisions to attack oh, airstrike in Syria. Yes, I watched the debate on, on the internet all last night. So yep. the vote but was however, <coughs> If whole community, Americans, France, other countries, are fighting with this power, IS, IS, mm -hmm. why you should be staying idle? So that was a, one of the powerful arguments in favor of bombing, was to be solidarity with our, with our allies. So I see that as a powerful argument. Mm -hmm. But against that argument, there are many mm -hmm. others. Clearly, mm -hmm. we're not here to talk about that particular decision. But uh -huh. I think the idea of being solidari having solidarity with your allies is a strong argument, yeah. Okay, let's go, uh, uh, before the end, we would like to go to the component of your lecture where the religious leaders, spiritual leaders, mm. 
media leaders, particularly religious leaders, playing an important role in building trust yeah. and maintaining <clears throat> the trust. Mm. So what I highlighted, I think, was that my experience now of, of tensions and conflict um, are not simply about resources or borders any longer. We now have a problem of uh, relationship between different faiths, different identities. Oh, um, so much. Brought about by the growing movement of people and the shifting of demographics. And I think we do quite a lot of work on the extent to which um, religious leaders who by their leadership corral large numbers of people as members of their churches or their faiths, what role they should play in helping to build trust and helping to build interfaith harmony. Um, one of the problems we have is that we have terrible things happening in the world in the name of religion. Not True. necessarily True. by religion, but True. in the name of religion. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. But we, so I, I think I am of the view that anyone with influence has responsibility to use that influence in a positive way. Okay. How about traditions, culture, in trust? Hmm. So there's not enough research been done on whether some cultures and some traditional communities have more or less trust innately. Mm -hmm. um, are we born trusting mm -hmm. and we learn not to trust? Mm -hmm. Or are we born without trust and we have to learn trust? Depends on our family. Yes, yeah, so there's little research whether it's nature or nurture, whether it's socialization. So, but I happen, I happen to think there is a, a baseline between all cultures where people can relate to a set of social norms, expected behaviors which they sign up to. Now, this comes about, and I know the, the quality of your question, comes about when different cultures coincide in the same city. When you have a culture that moves for whatever reason. London now, as you know, is a multicultural city with uh, huge numbers of different ethnicities, hundreds of different languages spoken on the streets and in our schools. Now Surprising, yes. Oh, you can go to a school in East London where my daughter lives, 20 different languages in one classroom. Wow. of 30 students. This is a multicultural place, and the very question you ask, how do we have trust when you have such difference? Well, it's hard, is the answer, but it's so necessary, you can see, by, by asking the question. And there are two answers that are used, the two extremes. One is that says anyone who joins the United Kingdom and who moves there and wants to live there should actually accept and adapt to the, to the norms of the United Kingdom. This is the so-called assimilationist view. And the other view says, no, that's not necessary. If you move to London, you can still have your own identity, but you have to respect social norms. You have to accept that there are certain things which are not negotiable. You have to be a citizen. My uh, last question would be, you are traveling, you have been a diplomat yeah. of your country to several countries, and you have been traveling a lot, like I hope many British Brits do. Where do you feel the most trusted? Ha! Huh. It's such a good question, because um, I'm very fortunate in that I'm at my senior stage in my career, I now lead a research center in we've built in, in the image that we wanted to. So we, we walk the talk, I assure you. This is a, an organization I'm very proud of, which uh, has a level of trust internally. But um, when I've traveled in other parts of the world, it's very interesting. I'm not considered a migrant or an immigrant. I'm considered an, ex an expatriate. <laughs> Somehow you don't have to earn your trust in these places. It's given to you because of our, our legacy and so forth. I see. But of all the problems we have in the United Kingdom, I can't think of anywhere better to live. Uh, your university, Coventry University, is being picked up or nominated as the University of a Year. It is, yes. Correct. It was announced uh, yesterday. We're very proud. This is a university that um, is quite modern. It's quite new. 
but to get the Times newspaper's um, vote as University of the Year for 2015 is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing with us this important value as a trust. Thank you. Thank you. When to do it, another man, the fact on the truth in such an Anglian Coventry extraordinary professor, Dr. Hardy or so. Хэрэгтэй бүхэлчлэгээ нийт орцогцлоос дэлхийн бэрэн дээр тоногдсон танцсан зэрэглэгийн орон сууцыг нэгээс хурамжны хугацаанд төлбөрөөдөн өөр юм болгох таатай боломжийг зөвхөн бид сонгуулгаж байна. Миний ертөнц миний уран бүтээлийн минь тусгал. King Tower Luxury Apartment.